So hello everyone. I think we need to get this started. And um, so we are coming to a graduate seminar of uh, Geotechnic Group in UOV this new semester. And uh, today we are pleased to have Dr. Dan to present his research work. Just uh, give you, you a small introduction of the presentation. And uh, in recent decades, school piles have become popular in applications where fast installation and cost effectiveness are required. Unlike unconventional driven for cost in place piles, screw piles are installed by torque. Screw piles are designed with multiple helical plates, continuous threads, or other shape, shaft modifications that are aimed to increasing the pile resistance or facilitating torsional installation. Because of this unique installation method and the pile shape, the capacity filler mechanism and the soil response to pile installation are to be examined in order to understand the soil pile interaction and guide the pile design. This presentation will introduce two example projects in the helical piles research in multiple scales, including full scale field testing and geotechnical centrifuge modeling. The full scale field research primarily determined the effects of pile spacing on the group capacity in cohesive soils and delineated the poor pressure behavior during pile installation testing. The second example, small scale foot long piles were installed by torque at a high centrifuge, centrifugal acceleration and loaded in actual directions. The centrifuge modeling tests were intended to investigate the helical pile failure mechanism and pore pressure response. The centrifuge test confirmed that centrifuge modeling offers an economical and reliable alternative to the field research in soil pile interaction. So Dr. Den is an associate professor of geotechnical engineering who joined the University of Alberta in 2013 after receiving his PhD from the University of California, Davis. His research interests include foundation engineering, earthquakes, geotechnical centrifuge modeling, code regions engineering, and ground improvement. This research has been supported by the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada, NSERC, and a number of industrial collaborators. He has supervised more than 10 graduate students on a variety of research topics. So with that, I would like to have um, Dr. Den on the, on, to present his um, research on the topic of information in school pile foundations from multi-skill testing. Now the floor is yours, Dr. Den. Okay, um, thank you. Right? Uh, thank you very much, Lan. And also thank you, um, the committee, right? the, the CGS student chapter for organizing this event. Uh, this, our geotechnical weekly seminar wouldn't be possible without contribution, right? without your, uh, your dedication, your contribution to our, you know, to our graduate education. So yeah, thank you. Uh, my kudos to the, the entire board of CGS chapter, right, student chapter. Um, and uh, okay, so go back to this one, right? So of course, it's nice to, <laughs> nice to see you, all of you back to school, right? Um, but unfortunately, we can, I cannot see you at this moment, you know, uh, but hopefully I'm gonna see you again, right? Hopefully see you again in the school and then next term when I, when I offer, G, you know, when I offer graduate level courses to all of you. Um, so yeah, in the past few years, I got a, I got an opportunity of working with a number of uh, industrial partners on several, you know, uh, pile foundation projects. And this one is about the one very unique, right, uh, unique type of foundations that's widely used and manufactured in Alberta. Um, it's called a, it's called helical pile, right? I make this more general, a screw pile. A screw pile is just a more, it's a bigger set, right? It's a, it's a, it's a larger set. Uh, but in fact, in this talk, I'm just going to focus on helical pile. Um, and as I, as Len just, as Len just introduced, right? Just, just give it two examples. Um, and then just introduce how this piling research is being conducted in generally in, in our, uh, research program, right? And then um, what is the methodology? What is the instrumentation, right? So just give you some sort of general concept and hopefully you can take away some key, right? The key uh, findings um, from, my, from my talk. So this, is, this, this talk has been, 
this talk right, uh, uh, was actually built by two of my two of my graduate students. <laughs> okay, so I'm just taking their slides and I'll have a modified little bit of course from them. And start start with introduction background, and you know, and then first example using a field research right, field research at full scale uh, helical pile, and then later on talk about centrifuge modeling and up helical piles. So conclusions as well. Of course, we're going to see two conclusions about each of these example, right? Research topic. So what a helical pile, right? Uh, 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 you, of course, everybody knows. Um, assuming that, let's assume that everybody knows about it. The, the conventionally, right? We teach you, right, in our courses, right, undergrad and grad level courses. Piles have been driven. It's been piles are conventionally driven or cast in place. And then we say we say these piles are in fact with either displacement pile or non-displacement piles, right? So it just related, right? As respect to the soil disturbance, basically, or whether there's a cavity, right? Whether there's a cavity generated from the you know from the pile installation. And this one, and this one's called helical pile. It's a quite a unique because these they are uh, installed by the torsion, not by the compression, right? And then it can carry, right, uh, this helical pile can carry a huge, a large amount, right, large amount of uh, vertical uh, load, not talking about lateral, but vertically can carry a lot of loads, right, when you compare uh, to the same volume, right, so compare the pile, compare the helical pile to conventional pile with the same volume or same cost. And the soil disturbance is considered, what, right, considered minimal, because of the, because the shaft usually are kind of skinny, shaft is skinny, and then the low is carried by the helices. Okay, um, and it's very quick. Can be very you know uh, I've seen the the construction and installation. They can be quickly installed by maybe just by one minute. Okay, um, so so yeah, and in just very brief history of this chemical pile. This was the first invented, right? Uh, according to my literature review, right? It was first invented in 1800 by the English, right? The English engineers um, in, uh, used in the Thames River, right? In London, near yeah, London. So they were used for the, uh, for the, um, the, to support lighthouse and other residential buildings. And after that, right, after that, in the recent like decades in the past, I would say decades, like five, five decades ago, right? This, uh, the piles are still kind of small, right? kind of small. Uh, a lot of research was conducted, lot, was conducted before uh, 40, 50 years ago, right? On the helical anchors, but they're most likely used for anchoring to provide attention, right? attention when you design, say retaining structure, right? Retaining structure or soil anchor walls. Um, but in the last uh, in the last few maybe some maybe twenty years, I would see we have seen a large a wider application of a large diameter, right? Much larger diameter in the foot scale, right? So like like this size um, to provide to provide the large, of course, the comp compressive and tension, right? Compressive tensile strength. And these piles are mainly manufactured in Canada. So that's why just to support, right, support the mining industry, uh, petroleum, right, the oil and gas industry, and then some other industries like in the residential houses because the booming, right, the booming economy, uh, housing, right, in Alberta. Um, so if you get a chance, right, if you get a chance so I just talk about my own experiences. I live in a neighborhood, like an old neighborhood, and so there's a lot of re renovations uh, in in this neighborhood. And then whenever I see people build, where right, the house owners they build the uh, they build them decks, and there's new houses and decks and fences, I um, see a lot of these helical pile installed, you know, for these small structures, residential buildings, yeah, in the residential applications. And commercially, these piles can be used for pipelines. And um, for transmission, right, pipelines, transmission towers are very much, very, very widely used in transmission towers. And next time when you drive uh, along the highway, just watch, right, just watch this. Uh, almost all of them are supported by steel piles. Uh, they need a large number, large quantity, 
large quantity of piles. So, and then the almost the only option is the helical pile because they can be deployed quickly, right? And of course, and as I said, our residential houses and the amount of piles as well. And then the other new applications of these piles is in the offshore industry. I uh, haven't got a chance to get into the offshore industry so far, uh, but it is being widely used in say offshore, offshore UK and offshore Australia, all right? Uh, Monopile is a huge diameter, right? A few meters diameter and a huge helical plate just to support this, uh, the wind turbines and also some other uh, offshore like oil and gas infrastructure, right? Um, um, but that's another, another very, you know, very unique industry, right? Um, and it, here we go, just show a couple of photos, right? The, the helical pile, look what the helical pile look like. Um, so it's got an opening, right? The opening, it's got an opening disc. Uh, right there is a very can be very quickly made manufactured in the house right so the opening size is called as a pitch right called as a pitch size uh, most of this pit this helical part has been kind of a standardized in Canada because it's a governed they are all governed by the Canadian right the Canadian construction material right uh, center right so it's like a CCMC right um, so if dimensions and dimensions and, and then the pitch they are they are, they are more or less unit uni, um, uh, standardized right now in Canada. So yeah, I also see this about you know the applications now for commercial or for even for bridges, right? You know, for for example, for this expansion, right? Expansion of the highway bridges in, in Perth, Australia. So that was a nice to see these applications. Um, okay, so yeah, this is just uh, a review of all the uh, the history and what this looked like. But the question is, right? Although we have uh, we have a lot of experiences where the industry and the manufacturers, the contractors, they have a lot of experiences with the, with the helical pile. Um, but I feel that when I when I spoke to them, I feel that they are you know they they, they are still not right the, the design or the capacity of the helical pile. It's just still a myth, right? still a myth. Um, how do we design this? Um, most people just use the torque factor, right? Uh, the empirical torque factor. But I went based upon my and my own experiences, right? The torque factor does not really reflect the mechanism. It does not really uh, way, may not be very may not be accurate when you have a um, heterogeneous soil layers, right? So that's the one problem, right? And also a lot of these piles are, are grouped um, to provide a larger, right? The larger resistance to the compression, the lateral, but the soil group efficiency, the pile group efficiency, uh, just still like a mythical, right? You know, like mythical to a lot of paper engineers, right? Um, but the engineers cannot do, right? They oftentimes they do not have this capacity to do the load, right? The institute of field loading test because it's very difficult because of all the equipment limitations. They don't have the, you know, most of them do not have the capacity or capability of running the final elements. So yeah, the group of fishes once becomes the one, uh, becomes one of the major concern when you, when you use them for large, right, for large infrastructure uh, applications. And then um, we talk about the soil setup. Right, um, you know, um, soil. We we learn the soil setup for conventional piles. Setup is the is the pro, is the process, right? The process of, of water pressure being dissipated after you install, right? Install or dri drive a pile into the cohesive material, right? So as the water pressure dissipates, the soil is supposed to supposed to heal, right? Heal, and then soil strength will get up, get uh, increased. So the pile capacity is supposed to increase after you, you know, after you, uh, after a while, and along with the time elapsed, right? Um, however, uh, because helical pile has got a skinny, right, skinny uh, shaft, so this disturbance, right, or cavity, right, the cavity generated by the helical pile shaft installation is a lot of smaller, right, a lot of smaller than not a conventional pile, it's a straight shaft pile. So yeah, the soil setup effect has been, it was researched in 
by just maybe one or two, right? One or two projects in the past, but the still, I feel like this is still not very well understood. Okay. And then how does the water pressure generate? How does water pressure dissipate, right? So that's a, another question, right? One of the, one of the problem statements. And then pile failure, right? Mechanism and a torque mechanism. Um, these need to be addressed. These also need to be addressed and refined, all right? Um, in the, right, so in the piling industry or in the piling research industry, um, people, right, uh, certainly people prefer, right, the field testing, right, field testing of uh, piles um, to confirm, right, just to confirm the design capacity and also to, to assure that, right, to assure that this is meets the, meets the, uh, the demand from the client. Um, but oftentimes we'll see, right, it's nearly impossible, nearly impossible to conduct uh, field testing of helical piles in some occasions, all right? And then the tests are kind of expensive, usually very, you know, are very expensive, uh, easily cost like a few thousand dollars a day, right? A few thousand dollars a day, including equipment and the post and then the field crew, right? Um, so one of the, another problem, right? And the problem is that affordable and technically feasible testing method for helical piles um, in lieu of the field tests. Okay, so as a geotech, as a geotech researcher, we uh, we need to right, we need to offer such right testing methods, and um, where we don't have a lot of options. In fact, right, so yeah, and that's uh, that's the last the second example, right? Just talk about centrifuge modeling, geotechnic centrifuge modeling. Okay, so let's just move on to with all these uh, problem statements and then the questions. So let's just move on to the first, uh, you know. Uh, the field test, right? Um, so this was uh, this was conducted by the master of the science students. Uh, he did a great job in the field and characterizing the soils and many, you know, uh, supporting the manufacturing and installing, right? Install the piles. Excellent job from the for the MSc students and also the instrumentation. Right? Everything to be worked out with them. Like within a year, right? within the year time limit. So that was a great, right? Um, I just, I will talk about this objectives later, but um, uh, we can look at the, look at the general, right? The general setup, uh, a configuration of the program, right? The test the program. So um, yeah, I see some, I see some, um, you know, qu some questions in the chat box. Uh, perhaps I, okay, so let me just, maybe, let me just finish this one and come back to the questions, okay? Yeah, uh, all right. So in this, uh, in this uh, research program, we selected a job site, right? A test site at the UFA, uh, located on South Campus. The reason, um, the reason I'm choosing that is this is cohesive material, and it's only, and they're close to the, uh, close to university campus, so, so a student can just walk to the site, and then you can see this. Uh, the, uh, see all these reaction piles being installed, and it's very you know. Uh, and before we conduct the field test, right? We off we are often we have to do the same investigation. So here's here we go. We got a soil test profile, right? Um, and I got a cone resistance, and from the cone resistance, we can figure out where you can in, interpret interpret the under shear strength. But as 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 we know, right, this under shear strength is not really is will be reliable unless we have a laboratory test, right? Laboratory test results to, to cross check uh, cross check the the interpreted under shear strength. So then we collected a number of a number of like you know the uh, undisturbed soil and laboratory experiments. Okay, conducted. So it confirms that, right? It confirms that these two values are you know matched very well. So that so that's that eases our our concern, right? So the soil we can we can we can uh, assure the soil profile will look like this. It's a stiff kind of a medium stiff clay. Um, the friction is about this much, and then from the also from the site investigation, we figure out this you know the soil profile with the groundwater table 
and also saturation. But we don't want to get into unsaturated soil mechanics. Um, plus, right, plus um, the helical helices are located, right? We're located below the groundwater table as the uh, groundwater table uh, um, as, you, as indicated on this two by these two dash lines. Okay, so yeah, um, and continue, right? Um, the pile were specially designed for this research project. So we have PA, PB, and PC, and, and then also a number of um, um, the a number of dimensions, right? The pile um, helical spaces. So this guy we have a space of nine point nine hundred fourteen. This is four hundred fifty you know, or fifteen hundred millimeters. We vary this pile spacing just to ver just to verify, right? so that we can verify the uh, we can derive, right? We can you know derive the failure mechanisms uh, along with the strain gauge data. Um, but now I guess we won't we won't talk about the failure. Um, and the uh, main objective is to look at the group efficiency of this uh, of this uh, these piles, and also the forward approach generation dissipation right from the installation or, or from the test. Um, here we go. It's got a, this. This is a reaction system, right? Um, and also reaction pile right here, and the equipment, right? Equipment and the, yeah, what is good about this is that right, as a field testing, as a convenient, is a it's a it's a convenient to be located, you know, with the UFA campus, and then there's not many instruments right needed right for this pilot research, so which is a good right. Um, so basically, we record the load versus displacement right of the pile at the pile head, and the pile uh, it's a it's a steel right so oftentimes people worry about the worry about this you know the deformation of the pile shaft uh we, we figured this out this may not be a big issue right it's not a big issue in this case um so um so then we follow the more or less right we just more or less follow the estm standard right for the short uh for the quick short uh, loading methods, right? We load, stop, we load, stop, load, stop, load, and stop. So each test will perhaps take a, a few, uh, we'll say two hours to complete, all right? Each, you know, loading test. And then, um, and it shows, uh, it shows the pile group, right? The pile group um, um, react, we, we also designed a reaction system to ensure that the the pile where right, the uh, uplift okay the uplift of this reaction system is a minimal um, uh, from the you know minimal from the loading test. Um, now, okay, instrumentation. Um, the key right the key to the success of uh, piling research in my opinion is that we if is the uh, measurement of the internal right, internal uh, reaction or internal load distribution of the piles so this is what it's about right when you we got to measure measure this in uh, internal axial forces or if you have bending right if you do the lateral loading then we have to measure the bending moments along the pile so that's the that's the key right um so we 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 develop that technique right so we can install install this a full uh full bridge right strain gauges and then covered by the protection sleeves and we use piezometers there's piezometers in in the middle right? as you can see from here right in the middle of the pile group um such that we can measure the port of pressure um and during during the loading during the installation and also during the, during the loading and this is the uh, uh, electrical uh, vibrating wire um, string string gauge based piezometer. So we don't have to worry about this uh, reading this manually. We don't need to read manually. Okay. All right. Okay. So the objective of this. Okay. Several objectives. One is to determine right determine the uh, SG over ratio. How does SG over ratio of the pile group performance? So we designed a pile, we designed you know, the pile group spacing two, three, and five. 
to uh, look SG, where SG is sent to center, D is a diameter, uh, diameter of the of the space. And so the reason for picking up these these values is that is 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 to comp you know is is such that these values are comparable to the uh, general practice. And our speculation is that right, once the spacing be, is beyond five, uh, the group spacing should sh group spacing effect right, uh, should becomes a minimum should become minimized. And two is a small number, right? And then uh, the other question objective is, is to find out how the group influences the installation induced the pore the pressure um, generate, generated in the group, all right? And as we mentioned, mentioned right? So the soil setup, and um, this is one of the myths right, in the industry, right? So that's the pile where right, generate a lot of water and the water pressure due from installation, right? And how long should we wait how long should we wait before we can load the pile? Okay, so there's a soil. So those are the questions related to the um, to the soil setup. And then, uh, and then the, the the other question, the other question we try to address is the how the group the group influences um, the pile load transfer and the failure mechanisms. Okay, um, all right. So the layout. A layout we have a spacing of uh, two, right? Spacing of two, um, spacing of three, three, and also spacing of five right here. And also we we designed, we also installed a few single helical pile with the uh, with the string gauge in instrumentation and also piezometers, right? Piezometers beside a single helical pile, but that will not be presented here. And also CPD boreholes right here, and then we conducted experiments. If you look at this table right here, conduct experiments uh, at a five hours, right? Five hours after the installation, and also seven days and nine days, and out of a uh, you know uh, past the uh, past the installation, right? The installation will take just maybe a, a minute, uh, but we we usually wait, right? We wait, we wait it until this until we thought the soil setup setup has been fully complete and the soil strength has been fully recovered. Okay. Um, all right. So yeah, we now the group efficiency is defined in this equation, right? As of, of course, it's a QG, right? Q uh, Q of the group and over the Q of individual, right? The summation of individual uh, capacities. Um, one of the issues that we we received or we are we are faced is that the installation torque they are not homo they are not really identical. Uh, but this curve may be a little bit uh, skewed, right? Because it will start from two thousand to five thousand. If it start from zero, it may look better, right? Um, anyways, the single piles has got a little bit smaller uh, uh, installation torque. Uh, a little bit smaller than the other than the piles in the group. So yeah, this is one of the beauty about the geotechnical engineering and the research. Right, there was got we got so many uncertainties uh, from the institute soil, and then so many answers, so much uncertainties in our prediction methods. Right, so yeah. Anyways, we cannot get away from that. So that's a uh, yeah. I think that's you know, um, it's a beauty, right? And um. So what we did is that when we when we see this, we we because the soils are kind of homogeneous along uh, you know along the helix steps. So what the one of the assumptions is that we make this uh, right, we make this uh, we we are, we are extrapolated right, extrapolate based upon the installation torque. All right, um, yeah, I got too much time. I'm twelve thirty two. I got to speed up. <laughs> okay. Um, now I think this is one of the key finding from it's based upon our observational right observation observational results. Uh, we haven't done any modeling yet, but based upon this, we can firmly we can firmly conclude that the group pile uh, helical pile uh, group efficiency does exist. Okay, so if you look at this one, uh, the horizontal axis is the groups. Spacing ratio SG over D, commonly right, commonly adopted in the industry, and then this group efficiency. So, um, 
we can clearly we can clearly see that as the space increases, right, the efficiency increases from ninety percent to about ninety seven percent, ninety to ninety seven percent, based upon our loading test. And then if you do this quickly, like say you do not allow for soil to set up, and the efficiency drops down to 90, maybe 80, I would say 80 percent to 90 percent. So that certainly the time becomes a critical here, and also spacing, where spacing becomes a pretty critical, uh, one of the critical factor, you know, affecting the um, group capacities. And then we also compare our result with the, we don't have binary element results, but we compare this with the uh, result from um, a PhD uh, thesis. Um, so compared with like, you know, the great, great circles, we can certainly see that uh, the results are close, right? Are close to the finite element simulations. Um, but in this simulation, there's no, there's no such a, uh, there's no such a, of course, um, a, a setup, right? And this one, this is from Converse in the Burr, right? The Burr equation, empirical equation. Yeah, I'm not sure whether you should trust that equation, right, for a helical pile, right? Um, in fact, if we, yeah, yeah, may, maybe not. But our bottom line is this, right? Bottom line is this: the um, for the commonly spaced helical pile, um, the group efficiency is big, right? It's pretty big. I would say above ninety percent. So that assures that can assures uh, assures design, right? Uh, of utilizing uh, helical pile groups and that uh, release the stress of the design engineers. And then this is the finding. This, uh, yeah, as the time, as the time drops, the efficiency drops as well. Right? And now, uh, pore water pressure, right? So this, yeah, this is quite interesting. I uh, hope that we get some time later, right? but not now, but later, we got some time to, to simulate this behavior, right? So we see the excess border pressure generation dissipation, as you can see from this guy, right? This, this chart, uh, the pile was installed at kind of a zero. Um, and then the, uh, the pore water pressure was uh, nearly nothing, right? Nearly nothing. Uh, upon the completion of the installation. But after a while, when after a while, the pore water pressure at the piezometer location started to increase uh, to the peak and then started to dissipate. So this, the following step, right, this, this step after installation is a caused by the uh, excess water pressure dissipation uh, from, the, uh, from the center uh, to the, to the uh, to the far field, right, to the free field. So the peak value is not related to the in instantaneous, right, not related to instantaneous uh, pore water pressure generation is caused by in fact from the, uh, from the uh, dissipation of water. Okay, so this guy shows, this figures, it shows single pass got a small value. Um, so, and then spacing, you know, SG over D3 got a little bit big. And as it go bigger, as the spacing becomes more compacted, uh, we can see this be be becomes uh, bigger, right? You know, the excess watershed pr pressure becomes a uh, uh, started grow. Um, okay, so certainly it shows the effect of the if the group efficiency group right group spacing um, on the on the pore water pressure generation. And then as the as the time elapsed, right the the water pressure will start declining, right? And then we can see the different rate. Uh, we, we believe that this is caused by the, this could be caused by the rate, could be caused by the spacing and also the, the length of the path, right? The length of dissipation uh, um, channels. All right, um, yeah, this, the, this, this one, this one shows the load distribution along this specific pile. SG over S, you know, space, uh, helical space in the five, very, very wide and spaced helixes, right? So we can see the individual burning, individual burning failure. Um, and this one is also critical to, uh, to our uh, application and then also confirms the accuracy of our measurements, right? 
So it is, is one of the, one of the I think this is also one of the most useful figure from this, from this publication or from this research. Um, QB over SU essentially defines, essentially defines the end bearing factor and for the lower helixes and upper helixes, lower helixes, you can certainly see that the, the factors are nine or 10, nine, between nine and 10. So if you can recall, you know, recall a foundation engineering, we say this is nine is typically selected. So it's close to nine or nine, right? So that confirms the accuracy of our results. Um, upper helixes, the, the NT, right? The ember factor drops quickly down to four and a four or five or six or seven. So yeah, that means that um, it is it, it should be all right. It, it, it will be a good practice to uh, to adopt a more conservative NT factor once you have this uh, uh, for this for these helices. We believe that this this small NT factor is caused by the in by an interaction between the pile uh, between the pile groups because this zone is within the confined zone, right? This helix is within the confined zone. Uh, the zone confined by the hit by the space, but this one is outside, right? It's outside. It's at the, the bottom. Okay. So, well, I think we need to suggest that we need to be more conservative when we uh, when we um, when we uh, adopt the end bearing for the upper helixes. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> conclusion. I'm not sure when. Uh, Twelve forty. Um, so basically, you find out a group efficiency uh, versus the you know, group efficiency versus the uh, the pile spacing and the group efficiency versus the time elapsed, and also we we find out NT right NT factor all right from uh, N bearing factors from our experiment. We suggest that at least we suggest that there's a there's a differential NT factors between upper and the lower helices. And, and then capacity was reduced by the excess of water pressure from the field. Okay. Um, this one, I, I, uh, I will have to go perhaps quickly as, the, as we have a very limited time, right? So I'll have to skip some of the slides. Just bear with me, for, sorry about that. Yeah, bear with me, okay. Um, so hopefully this, is a mix, this makes sense. We understand geotechnically was the geotech material, the uh, prop by material is highly dependent on the uh, stress level and also stress history, right? So it's very difficult. A lot of times it's very difficult to conduct a test in the field, in the field scale, right? So we're dealing with 10 meters soil, maybe with a large, uh, large earth structure. Um, however, we can simulate, right? Simulate the similar, right? Similar, uh, we can mimic the stress distribution and also stress history. Uh, in the laboratory, using in the laboratory using uh, the geotechnic centrifuge. Okay, so the key is that we key is to increase the gravity, right? Increase the gravity, and then and then when we when we uh, when we mimic the stress history, that means that consolidation st stage and maybe some cementation for the sand consolidation of clay. Uh, we you by you know the soil history can be mimicked. From the preparation, right, the soil construction um, stage. So, and then this is this shows the figure of the centrifuge as this, you know, is from Navio, right here, nice job, Navio. And so, as we spin up, as we spin spin up, and this soil box will uh, will start to rotate, and then until until you see the horizontal centrifugal acceleration, you know, outbound, right, outbound acceleration. To simulate the soil stress uh, field in the in, in the stress field in the soil, and then here we go. We've got all the all the you know, scale of factors um, for for static loading test, uh, maybe for also for the dynamic loading test, but dynamic field, and then also for the consolidation uh, scale factor could be different. Depends on the scenarios, right? What it, what is the main phenomenon, right? It's a phenomenon that you are trying you try to simulate. And here shows the setup of here, and then students did an excellent job in in uh, fabricating, you know, the box, and then figured out how we install the pile and load the pile in situ at a centrifuge acceleration, 
and we can uh, what I can we can claim that this is the one I think this must this is the first experiment in the, in the world that installed a pile in situ and it will measure the torque values and then measure the internal load distribution in the in the model pile. So yeah, we can certainly argue, we can certainly claim the originality of this of this centrifuge test uh, helical pile. Um, several objectives. Um, so may I just have to go through this quickly, right? Model pile. Um, yeah, so the the prototype could be five meters long, right? Um, and the model pile just becomes a foot long in you know in the laboratory. And we have a lot of strain gauges that we can measure the internal load distribution and also torque gauges, right? Torque gauges right here to measure the torque, uh, installation torque. Okay, so just gonna um, the pile, you can see the power dimensions. You can see the power dimensions right here, S over D. We vary the S over we vary the spacing so that we can clearly see uh, the effects on the this effect on the fader mode. Um, All right, uh, just continue. It shows the layout, layout of the piles, testing piles, and also the vertical view of the piles. Okay, it wouldn't be important. It would be. It would take us like at least a, a month, right, to finish uh, the piles to finish installing and loading the test. But in the laboratory, in the centrifuge lab, we can. This is all done within just a few few days, right? Just within a few days, uh, with the minimal, very minimal. The human resource support. Right? Uh, here we go. We we developed the technique of installing the pile for the first time well, in the world. Uh, this technique that we can we install it, this by by the torque at a high centrifugal acceleration. Um, and then it shows the consolidation stage when we when we uh, when we cons construct the soil uh, the soil prop. And then we have with this two, we conducted a two test series um, with some, some different SU and also OCR values. All right, and then here we go. Certainly, we have to determine uh, the soil profile and under shear strengths, the peak value, right? The peak under shear strengths and residual under shear strength. All right. Uh, for the first test series and for the second test series. Um, and then OCR becomes, OCR is like this much, just because the consolidation, right? From the consolidation stage, right? The consolidation pressure was like a 1500 kPa, um, but in the centrifuge lab, this, this, this effect is just cut low, right? So we have very much OCR and sensitivity is about this much, about three, two, five, and two, three, like this. Here we go. Okay, so yeah, the main key finding. One of the key findings is that right. Um, how do we estimate the power installation torque values? Um, so are we a centrifuge test give us a a, a a good mechanism and things right? So um, we have the we notice that the, the soil is nearly right. So it's nearly fully uh, disturbed from the installation. So we believe that the residual state resistor state is likely likely to likely to govern the soil pile adhesion during the installation. So therefore we propose this simple mechanism, very simple mechanism using the residual state, residual, um, you know, uh, or remote shear strength, right? Um, and then we estimate it's just based upon the soil strength and the contact area. And this proposed the torque factor has, has several components. Um, from the torque and also from the helixes. So here we go. This is a measure of the, these are the measured values compared with the compared with the uh, uh, our estimation. So yeah, our estimation using the peak using the residual right uh, residual strength. So our conclusion is that if you look at this figure, nice very nice for summary, right? very nice summary of all of the test results. So we notice that these uh, estimated values. Kind of close, right? Kind of close to the measured values at the end. So this confirms, right? This can confirm that the residual, actually, the residual state um, um, governs, right? Governs the soil pile interaction. Yeah, I think this is this may not be the, a 
may not be the same, right? This, this conclusion may not be the same, um, the same as the conclusion from the literature. Uh, I believe that, I think, I believe that this is caused by the, because the, the helix disturbance, right? The, the helix cut into the soil and disturbed the, the soil, um, okay, in our centrifuge test. And then the pore water pressure distribu distribution, uh, we, you know, I think we talk about this in our advanced foundation courses, right? The pore water pressure generated as the pile cavity expanded, right? And we just adopted theory from Mark Randolph and then Roth, right? The, the, uh, the classical publication. So we adopt this U naught values. And then we all, yeah, we realized that and uh, yeah, we found out, you know, and now it's a dissipation history, right? So this dissipation was derived, uh, in fact, derived from the heat transfer, right? Classical heat transfer solution. Um, so we, um, we used that equations, right? The, the Mark Randolph theory and predict the, the peak value and also dissipation. So the peak value does not really match what we measured. And that's the problem. I think this is a, uh, yeah, theory is a theory. That's not, is not always true. But dissipation, where right? dissipation looks like, it looks okay, it looks this okay, all right. Um, and then the failure mode. So on top of the cylindrical and individual failure mode, we notice there's another, another failure mode, like a, we call this a transitional failure mode, right, like this. And there's for the intermediately spaced um, helixes in between uh, in the pile. And then the low displacement curves and the, from the low displacement curve, we can identify, we can interpret this, uh, you know, the end bearing resistance and also NT factor. And just to confirm the accuracy of the centrifuge test result again, right? It looks perfect. I think, I think this result looks perfect. Right? QH over ASU, if you look at this one, our results shows the anti factor starting from about eight to 12, right? Eight to 12, it fluctuates around nine or 10, but it's, I think, but I think it's perfect to us. It, it certainly confirms uh, the, the, the accuracy of the strain gauge measurements and it confirms the, you know, the uh, deep pile failure mode at the bottom, right? Near uh, of the lower helixes. Uh, for the breakout, you know, for the tension, right, for the tension, uh, we also look at a breakout factor, which is a five, ranges from five to seven. Uh, it looks okay, it looks okay to us for the breakout factor tension. And we follow this failure mechanism, right, the cylindrical sharing, you know, individual bearing, and also transitional sharing, and we, can you know back calculate a low transfer and compare with the measured values and we yeah it's difficult to explain all of the details but I think of this as a you know looks like they are it's, you know it's just but they look pretty close that's what we can close to the measurements that that's the one of the bottom conclusion all right yeah so it ran out of time sorry about that right so yeah, from the centrifuge modeling, we, we developed equipment and also obtained right, the experiences um, at our geo, GeoSurf centrifuge lab so that we can use this for the other, for the future soil power interaction via simulations. And then we, we conclude that the residual state um, likely dominates the pile installation torque and pore water pressure is generated and then we predict, right, we predict the pore water pressure and then predict the pore water pressure dis dissipation um, using the Randolph theory. And then we also notice the failure mechanism, the, uh, you know, is, uh, uh, is certainly affected by the pile, right, pile spacing or helix spacing. Okay, the lastly, I will just acknowledge the, the contribution of the grad students, right? Um, Stefan and Wei Dong, and, and uh, of course, a lot of field crew members, and our centrifuge lab, right? Our centrifuge lab, Gonzalo, Ya Zhao, and Dr. Chalatronic, and also a number of sponsoring uh, sponsorships, all right? Um, so I would just move quickly to the, sorry about that, quick, move quickly to the 
uh, to the uh, questions. Oh, thank you a lot, Dr. Dan, for your presentation. And it's a very excellent and comprehensive work about the helical piles. And uh, yes, in the Q&A, we encourage you to type the question into yeah. the chat box. So we'll follow up each question one by one. And mm -hmm. the first one is from Hamid. Hamid, to it. Um, yeah, I can, I can read, uh, yeah, Lam, don't worry, I can read out the question set and then uh, I can, I can, you know, I can provide my best answer, right, no worries. So the qu first set, the first question from Hamed, right, could, could you categorize the fatal mechanism of single helix screw pile under tens tensile compressive load, both shallow and deep embedment cases? Yeah, I think we have, we uh, did, sh I did show that, I did show the photo, but uh, people usually think and in the in the, the practice in the practice, people usually think there is a uh, individual failure, and and also and also the cylindrical failure uh, for single helix uh, single helix pile. Uh, but I can I think you can also refer to this photo right here. But this photo, right? This photo clearly shows the failure, right? The fail the shear failure um, surfaces. As we uh, as as we have single or in or or like you know double helixes pile. Um, all right, there are questions from Mohammed, right? Since efficiency of the pile depends on uh, depends on the time with the passage of the time efficiency of the helical uh, with the passage of time, the efficiency of a helical pile increases. Based upon the statement, can we measure the time theoretically after the installation of the piles where the efficiency is a maximum? And then we can let our clients know to build the, the superstructures and, you know, if we can. All right, so that's an excellent question, right, uh, uh, Mohammed. Okay, um, so I, according, so if you look at this one, you know, this time, um, time is money, right? Clients certainly, all, almost all of the clients wants to build up, want to wants to apply the structure load immediately after the pile is after the pile has been installed. Um, but as a geotech engineer, we have to we have to say no, right? I have to say no. Since when can we install the pile? Um, so a general a general recommendation is seven days. You you got to wait for seven days until the pile until the soil pore the pressure has been fully dissipated and the soil strength has been fully recovered. Um, this is supported, right? This is also supported by my um, field test results. If you go back to this one, right? The uh, uh, efficiency, right? This guy right here, the excess water pressure in general dissipated to nearly, you know, maybe 10%, right? So it's been 90% consolidated after about seven days post installation. Okay, seven days, I think that's one, maybe that's the one that wrote down. If you do not know the property of the pile, uh, no, no, do not know the property of the soil. And then I would also suggest, right, if you, are, if you have a maybe larger diameter, larger diameter or, or, or perhaps a low permeability clay, right? And also maybe space, group spacing, it's not a bad idea, right, to uh, wait for longer, right, post the seven days, um, after seven days, and then they can start applying the structural load, superstructure load. Uh, that makes sense, Mohammed? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, the other, so that question, other question says for soil with OCR greater than one, how can we design these uh, uh, helical pile through, uh, uh, how can we design these helical pile during the for drainage, uh, though drainage? Um, yeah, it was uh, some, you know. Um, OCR was not, you know, this case OCR is, it's, it is a critical, right? So OCR will dominate, the OCR will dominate the residual or, um, you know, the disturbed, right? The disturbed uh, soil strength in, in this case. Um, so, yeah, um, you, 
this uh, I don't know what about drainage yeah but we have this moment I don't think we have I don't think I have a, a lot of hint I don't have any clue uh, about the drainage you know or the the <laughs> the rate of drainage so this is something I do not really understand right The other uh, from you from land right prediction from land uh, prediction of excess water pressure build up near the pile installation uh, from window and Randolph solutions the base of the cab expansion yeah in in normal as consolidated claim maybe try other solutions with the particular over consolidation ratio for the claims to use right, that's a great comments Len. Um, we use the Randolph the original original classic solution for Randolph and then broth uh, based that was a based upon cam clay right cam clay and also cam, you know expansion right cavity expansion theory for the for conventional pile I just no no cam, no convention no such convention just a cavity expansion theory and cam clay model um, yeah that's I think yeah that's a great great comments and um, in the in the past the two pay to 20 years, I will see several other publications out of Randolph and his own students. So perhaps, yeah, it would be a good idea to try other solutions to, uh, to particularly to look at effects of over consolidation ratio on the rate of, uh, uh, on the rate of water, excess water pressure and also the magnitude of excess water pressure. Thank you, right, good, good comment. Um, so, yep. Yeah. So with that, I think you know we have all the questions here, and uh, thank you, Dr. Len, for answering those questions, and uh, thank you again for um, mm -hmm. spending your time and sharing this presentation with us. Oh, I have actually another one coming. Uh, actually, sorry, one o'clock. It's probably the last one. Okay. Uh, yeah. Is it possible to mm -hmm. use larger to suppress uplift caused mm -hmm. by the soil failure in high depth? Oh, uh, uplift caused by the soil failure in high depths. Um, in sh uh, is, I guess I, th I think this way, you know, this depends on how shallow are you talking about, right? Um, if you, I, my recommendation is that do not use the, do not use the screws in the shallow depths uh, because you're going to quickly get into the frost heave issues, right? Uh, one of the benefits of having this helical pile is that you know they, they are deeply embedded, so you can also provide the tensile resistance to the to the um, to the frost right, heave. Uh, if you're going to use this for shallow, usually we say when we say shallow, usually it means like a few diameter, like three diameters deep, right? Like three diameters deep. And then if it's a shallow, then we we can we're going to see a very different failure failure mode uh, that becomes shallow failure mode, uh, not deep deep anymore, right? So yeah, uh, certainly there's a good comment, good question, uh, but we have this other concern as well. Is there any uh, effect of helical pitch on the polar pressure generation? Uh, we are not able to identify that yet. In my view, right, from, Ad, from Adnan, uh, the other one, from Poya, right? In my view and based on my, my own research, there's a new moderate load carry mechanism of screw power in sand is this between cylindrical and individual bearing beta mode um, yeah this is something that we are trying to we're trying to address at this moment we are we are working on a pile helical pile test in sand and hopefully we're able to address these by right, the lower mechanism but I might believe that this cylindrical and individual fairy beta mode uh, these are too general. These are too general. They are, do not really reflect uh, the failure mechanism of piles in the in sands, particularly in sands. Um, so hopefully, uh, oh yeah. All right, I think I should stop um, the trend here. And uh, thank you again, Dr. Dan, for your presentation. And uh, if anyone has any concerns or comments or questions, you can always contact them by email. And uh, and we just need to keep the graduate seminar on time, just mm -hmm. um, for the sake of time. And um, yes, yeah, so with that, I will just conclude this graduate seminar and um, um, say thank you to everyone to join this. And then we'll come to our next one next Wednesday, I guess. That's right. Thank you, Lam. And thank you. you for coordination. See you. See you around. <laughs>